Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar. Uh, and we are just so grateful that you are able to join us. I know there's people from all over the world uh, with us today. And so we are um, really excited to have you have you here with us to hear the remarkable presentation that your that Dr. Seema Samar is about to uh, to give us on the state of women's uh, affairs and women's human rights in Afghanistan. We're so lucky to have her because she's about, she's been in you know giving talks all over the country. So we're particularly grateful that she's agreed to be here with us today. Um, but I would like to just point out that this seminar is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs here at Harvard, along with the program on negotiation at the, at the Harvard Law School. And we'd like to uh, point out that this uh, session is being recorded. So if any of you want to hear this again or refer it to other people, in about a week's time, um, it will be up on the Program on Negotiation website under the, under the events um, Herbert C. Kelman Seminar. So you can, you can uh, look for that in about a week. Uh, the other thing, I uh, just wanted to point out that um, this will be an hour uh, seminar and uh, Dr. Samar will be speaking for about 30 minutes after which we'd like to uh, open up the discussion to, for you in the audience. And we'd also like to ask that you not put the questions in the chat function, but in the Q&A. And what I'll do is I'll read uh, Dr. Samar, I will read her the questions and she will, she will answer them. But um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I, again, I can't tell you how lucky we feel that we are to have um, Dr. Samar with us, and I'll just read you her, her introduction. She is, uh, Dr. Seema Samar is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, rena renowned human rights advocate, and has dedicated her life to public service, humanitarian work, and women's empowerment. Since 2002, she's been the chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, which holds human rights violators accountable and sets the human rights agenda in Afghanistan. She is the chairperson of the Commission for the Prevention of Torture and was the chairperson person of Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions. Prior to her appointment at the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, she was vice president of the interim administration of Afghanistan and the first Minister of Women's Affairs. Dr. Samar served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Sudan between 2005 and 2009, and has been appointed as a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Mediation. She also served as a member of the High Level Panel for Internal Displacement. She is also the founder of the NGO Shuhada, which operates 55 schools for girls and boys in Afghanistan and three schools in Quetta, Pakistan for Afghan refugees. In addition, the school operates 12 clinics and three hospitals in Afghanistan and one hospital in Quetta for refugees dedicated to providing education, healthcare, particularly focusing on women and girls. Um, Dr. Samar has continuously advocated for the world's underrepresented and marginalized groups, such as women, children, and minorities, with the firm belief that respect for human rights and human dignity, equality between the people and access to justice will change the reality on the ground and reduce conflict. So Dr. Samar, we are just thrilled to have you as I I've said over and over again here in your introduction, and I'm going to turn the, the floor over to you now, and I'm going to disappear. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to, uh, to talk to you today. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, send my deep condolences to the family of Kelman, who recently died, and I'm uh, happy to talk and use her, his center. Um, 
Secondly, I would like to also uh, share my solidarity with the women in Ukraine and the people in Ukraine for the aggression that they face. And I'm saying this because it's unfortunately the same situation as we had in Afghanistan and the war, the 44 years of war in Afghanistan started with the Kodata by the pro-Russian in 1978. And then the invasion of Russians, USSR on that time uh, to Afghanistan in 1979. Uh, the USSR came to Afghanistan with military forces in order to support his uh, friends in Afghanistan and their government and Kodata government in the country in order to save their, their face, according to them, uh, their revolution in Afghanistan. So the, from that day when the war started, we continued to, to face the, the different kind of a conflict and continued violent uh, conflict uh, in Afghanistan. So it's 44 years. It's easy to say, but it's very, very difficult to, to live in that situation uh, all of your life. Uh, when the USSR came to Afghanistan, they started to um, restrict people's human rights. People did not have the right to exercise their, uh, their even their religion uh, easily. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech was out of question. And the, the whole policy of either you with us or my enemy was applied on the people. So people started to fight against it. That's why I'm saying that what we see today in Ukraine is almost similar to, to the situation in my country. Uh, in fact, when they came, they promised that they provide, it was communist you know, at that time, or, um, provide food, shelter, and close the people. That was the, uh, the overall um, issue that the, the pro-government in the Russian and Afghanistan was raising. In reality, they took all those from the people. They destroyed the shelters of the people. They uh, bombed different villages without, without any cautious or protection for civilian. They even uh, bombed the uh, water points in different villages and, and people's livestock. So the, the violation of human rights was started because uh, uh, the people were pushed to be with the government, with the communist kind of a policy. The resistance by the people started without any support from outside. Unfortunately, it was Cold War and it was the time that the people uh, really wanted to, um, the Western countries and also Arab countries, wanted to stop the Russian uh, uh, invasion further to the south, or the uh, increase of the Russian presence in the South Asia. And that's why the, uh, your country here, the US, and also some other Western countries, including the Arab countries, they started to uh, choose and support the most conservative group of people in Afghanistan, unfortunately. And those people who were choose by them, they were trained, they were uh, given money, of course, beside their training, and they given uh, a lot of weapons in order to fight and stop the Russian, uh, stop the Russian to, to further go to the other countries and reach to the, uh, to the water and south uh, uh, towards Pakistan and um, also towards India. And that was actually uh, one of the reasons that we had the Mujahideen. Those freedom fighters, they, uh, they started also when they got, at the beginning, they were really honest people, but they start to stand against whatever policy was even better for the people like access to education, they destroyed the schools and, uh, and the both side actually did not pay much attention to the provision of basic social services to the people. So uh, in fact, people were unfortunately was, was forgotten in between and everybody was trying to arrest the people. It was a lot of arbitrary arrests and disappearances of, of people the teachers from university, including my own family, we lost uh, a lot of people from my, my own family and I lost my, my husband also on that time. 
he was taken one night and he never returned. So it was, that was the policy by the pro-Russian government, pro-USSR government on that time. So the, the whole green belt was, that's why there was possibility for Pakistan to, to promote the Islamization and also the uh, Islamic revolution in Iran was happened during that time. It was just after one year of Afghan uh, uh, and and earlier of the uh, USSR invasion in Afghanistan when they allowed the Islamic revolution in Afghanistan, unfortunately. And this whole uh, fighting during the 44 years, different regime came and gone, but in the, in the middle, women were forgotten because nobody really paid attention to women's cause or women were really out of, uh, out of rather of everything, not even simple, uh, health and education um, projects was well, well, it's not existing. So a lot of people were forced to leave their countries. I mean, a lot of people were the, internally displaced and we had millions and millions of Afghan who were forced to be refugee in Pakistan and also in Iran. Particularly in Pakistan, at least it was more than 6 million people. So imagine that the people came with their children and no, no school, no, no health services for them. And then particularly no school. And the, again, the Western countries in the Arabs really supported their religious school. The families were really poor and they were living in a refugee camps under the tent and it was all the policy or even for provision of relief program was really male dominated and male designed. So nothing for women actually in that situation. It was so difficult to find money for health and education for, for girls and women in the country because everybody was saying, first they were saying health and education is a development program, it's not emergency, but Afghanistan situation is emergency situation. So that was the, the truth and the reality in the ground. And yeah, there were the women in the camps, of course, they didn't have access to uh, reproductive, proper reproductive health. And I was working in the refugee camp on that uh, in 1984. I was forced also to leave the country and go to Pakistan to be refugee in Pakistan. It's very difficult to explain the situation or the status of refugees without identity in those countries. I mean, in some other countries, you have a legal documentation, but there was not a lot of legal documentation for the Afghan refugees in Pakistan. So they started this religious school because families were big and they didn't, were not able to feed their children. So they give their children, young boys, boys at the age of six or seven or eight to these religious madrasas and they're grown up in those, in those set up. Uh, they were brainwashed. They have not been with their family. They have not seen the mother's relationship, the mother and son's relationship, or even the love of the mother. Um, so they, they came up with this mentality of uh, completely against women uh, in Afghanistan. So we had this prolonged, violent, aggressive war in the country continued until 1988. In 1988, there was a, a Geneva court, Geneva, um, peace process. It was a lot of talk between the Afghan government and also Pakistan on behalf of Mujahideen. It's interestingly, on behalf of the resistance, Pakistan was, was there. And the US and the um, USSR was uh, signed on that accord in Geneva in May 1988 in order to uh, facilitate the withdrawal of the troops of the USSR in the country. After killing a lot of people, after using 100 40,000 US, uh, USSR soldiers in Afghanistan in order to convince people. Um, so that G Geneva Accord in 1988 was, uh, as I said, that was signed between the two countries, uh, four countries, two was witness and two was um, actually signatory to. Nobody consulted with the people and women were not involved. Women would not present even, and also in the delegation of the, the witness countries where women were not there. 
So that's uh, end up um, with the withdrawal of the Russian troops from Afghanistan. But the pro-Russian government, which was Dr. Najibullah at that time, they resisted for three years. I'm saying this because to compare the current situation with the previous situation that we had in the country. Um, then we had the Mujahideen government on that time, they, uh, with the Pakistan support, completely ISI was, uh, was de deciding and supporting. They established an interim Afghan government, again, very male dominated and very much uh, only the uh, exclusive uh, of one and two ethnic group who were based, the Mujahideen group, seven Mujahideen group were based in Peshawar. Um, just established a government between them. Nothing of, uh, uh, for women. And they, no woman, of course, was there. There was um, a rumor that one of the uh, commanders said that, should we have a department for women's affairs? And the other one jumped and said, which kind of a Muslim you are that talking about women in establishment of a department for women? So that the whole foundation for such an First, such a gender apartheid and, and discrimination against women was put earlier because women were not carrying the gun. So you could see that how even the UN, UN agencies and, and the international community and NGOs were really looking at the issue of women's rights in the country. I remember that uh, after the withdrawal of the USSR, uh, United Nations started a coordination um, center called Salam operation. Salam means in, in Arabic means peace. Salam operation, so it was, uh, they wanted to coordinate the, um, the development program in Afghanistan, uh, in Afghanistan. So UNDP started their office in Kuwait. Eh? So I got the, I called and got the appointment and I went to see the person and I said, okay, this is um, early nineties and late 89. Everybody knows that it was, talks about women's inclusion and women's in development, women's role in development of the countries. So I said, oh, I'm so glad that you started your office here. And then do you have any program for women? And this man looked at me. It was an American man, actually. He said, woman in Afghanistan? And I said, yes. He said, I was in Lugar in one of the uh, provinces in Afghanistan I haven't for a week and I haven't seen any woman. I, I smiled, I said, do you think these heroes who fought with the USSR and um, pushed the USSR soldiers from Afghanistan? And currently it was already the beginning of the destruction of the USSR um, structure in the country. And I said, do you think those people, those heroes who fought against the USSR and against the communist, communism, um, they fall from the, uh, the sky. And he was, of course, he become red and, and sweating. Uh, I said, women do exist. They born from their mothers. And then later on, they started some, some program, but it was not much. So women were denied of all the program. Then Mujahideen went to Afghanistan and started their government in 1992. And they start fighting because they were not one of them or two of them who was in power, they were not willing to share the power with the others. So again, women's issue was, was very much political and they did not allow women, uh, they did not include women on the any decision making or any position of power. So I give you an example how they did. I and mean, they uh, we had only one television on that time, the national TV of, of Afghanistan. And they, um, a woman who was presenting the news on that time, they said, oh, women should not be seen in the te television. So woman was reading the, the news, but it was a rose in the television. And then they said, oh, I think it's, we should not hear the voice of, of woman who is not related to us. So they remove women from the media even. So it was a lot of, they put a lot of restriction on a woman's clothing and, and how to, uh, we should be covered. And also, I remember when it was 1994, when it was the Cairo conference on, on uh, population and development, um, Afghan government on that time, which was the Mujahideen government, they did not allow any delegation from Afghanistan to attend. 
because they were saying that they are discussing on Islamic issues. I'm saying this because the whole structure of uh, training and, and empowering the fundamentalism in patriarchy in male domination was also, uh, unfortunately, um, Western countries were involved and Arab countries were involved. Um, and then in 1994, when uh, Pakistan wanted to send their goods through Afghanistan to Turkmenistan, um, they, because it was fight between the different Mujahideen groups, one of the, um, or one or two of the Mujahideen group tried to stop the Pakistani goods, not, I mean, to loot, to take it because it was really a narcissism in the country. Every corner of the country was controlled by one group of the uh, either ethnic group or political group of the Mujahideen. Then the Pakistanis, uh, Pakistan government on that time, Nasrullah Babur was the uh, interior minister of Pakistan. He sent a group of Taliban to fight against that group in order to release the Pakistani goods. They were successful because the Taliban said that they bring the the rule of law, they collect all the weapons from the different Mujahideen group. And, and all, they were also saying that they will bring the former king from Italy back to power. The people really was tired because of the, the situation that was existing in Afghanistan. Forced marriage, child marriage was very, very common because they were not the proper schooling, not the, not the provision of basic social uh, services, including health services for the people because everybody was busy and fighting. And um, so that was also one of the reasons that the Taliban took power in 1994 in Kandahar next year in 95 in September. It was always September, unfortunately. Uh, this time they came earlier than September. <laughs> they came in August. In 1995, they took Herat, another big city in the west of Afghanistan. And then in 1996, they came to Kabul and uh, took Kabul from the Mujahideen and slowly they moved up to north of the country. By 1998, Talman already took the uh, most of most part of the country. There's some spots in some district and some corner of Afghanistan was still under control of the other Mujahideen group. So Talman started a few things. One, their war against women. women was not allowed to work, women were not allowed to walk, women were not allowed to go to get education. Girls' education was completely banned. And it was the only official on, on the last century that uh, uh, the only government where officially banned the uh, education for, for women and girls. Uh, only women, few women who were allowed to practice and work was the under the health sector. The other section sector was completely uh, a ban for Afghan women. That was one of the issues that Afghanistan was really turned to be the biggest prison in the world of women in the country. At least 10, 12 million uh, people were under house arrest. And then Afghanistan became the biggest producer of drug and opium. They were, I mean, reaching everywhere. Although I, when I spoke with the Afghanistan desk officer in 1999, um, I said Afghanistan is turned to be, have three problems. One, Afghanistan became the training camp for all the terrorist uh, groups because we knew and everybody saw that the attack in uh, American embassy in Africa, in Tanzania and Kenya, was done by Al Qaeda. They took the responsibility also, and there was attack on the uh, one of the um, boats of the U.S. in Yemen water close to the Yemen border. Uh, I think it was twenty more than twenty soldier American were killed on that attack. Uh, in retaliation of that uh, terrorist act in Africa. There was missiles fire on Afghanistan on the so-called training camp. I be, I personally believe um, it was 85 missile fire on Afghanistan, and it was also missile fired on Sudan. And I I saw the um, the uh, factory which was producing medicine in Khartoum, which was hit by the American missiles on uh, later on, of course. 
Um, they, the your country or the it was Clinton administration when they attacked the uh, Afghan uh, Afghanistan soil, uh, claiming that they attacked the Al Qaeda training camp. The the people who were sharing intelligence, I believe, that give the intelligence to the U.S. to fire missiles and give the also the information before the missiles fired to the group to leave the camps. So everybody escaped them, I and it was only a few junior Taliban style or terrorist people who were killed in that um, training camps. And some of the missiles did not explode. Of course, China bought it. So it was uh, uh, that kind of a situation. And also the production of opium, as I said, that it, we, we turned to be the biggest producer of opium on that time. And also, women were in prison. I mean, they ordered that the, uh, the people or families who has double story houses, the, the windows should be painted because women should not be seen from outside. TV was not allowed, the camera was not allowed, music was not allowed, still it's going on, they, they don't allow music in, on, the, uh, on the television and, and publicly. But of course, people are able to listen to music now on their homes, but in low, low voices. Um, so that was the situation and 9-11 happened. And 9-11, you could see that 19 or 24 people who were involved on that attack, I mean, it was a horrible attack. Uh, of course, it was uh, well, crime, of, crime against humanity. You just attack civilians without, uh, any precaution or any respect to international human rights and humanitarian law. Then the, again, the American and the NATO forces uh, interfered in Afghanistan. Uh, I would say this time they didn't have enough time to plan, but it should have been a proper uh, long-term strategy for removal of the Taliban from power. And Taliban failed. And that the new government, the interim government was started in Bonn this time, in Bonn agreement it was. This time the, the meeting was sponsored again by the United Nations and facilitating by United Nations. Uh, in Bonn, so they, at least in Bonn agreement, it was uh, different people, very few women. I think one woman was from the King group uh, who was, she was also named Sima, unfortunately she died a few years. Um, but then what was good with the Bun administration, uh, uh, Bun agreement was they divided the, the power between the different groups, but they did not, of course, involve the Taliban. And for me, as, as a woman in that country, there was two good outcomes. One was the Ministry of Women's Affairs. I'm not saying because I was put on that position. I was, I did not, they asked the civil society organ. Um, meeting parallel to the political meeting. Uh, and I was invited to that meeting, but then I couldn't go. I was supposed to, to be in Canada. Uh, in any case, it was a new government and um, this Ministry of Women's Affairs. I think it's very, very important because it's acknowledged the existence of women. I'm not saying that the Ministry of Women's Affairs will solve all the problem, but symbolically, it was a good move. And then the other thing was the establishment of uh, Afghanistan and uh, the National Institution for Human Rights in Afghanistan. Um, both, I was the, the first minister of women's affairs for six months because I was calling for accountability, injustice for crimes committed in the past in Afghanistan. Uh, um, some people, including people in the cabinet did not want me in that position. It was a long story to, to share. But uh, I was pushed to, re to be out of the cabinet uh, because of my uh, attitude and my call for justice, for accountability in respect for human rights. And I think um, one of the collective failure that we all face is lack of uh, implementation of accountability and justice and also human rights in general. But anyway, uh, I was the first Minister of Women's Affairs and I was the first chair of person of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. With the involvement of the international community, we really achieved a lot in the country. There was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, 
achievement then in the human rights. I mean, in a country where, for, I give you an example, torture was very common. Everybody was tortured when they were arrested and detained. But then with the monitoring that we did uh, in the Human Rights Commission of the detention centers, people were not able to monitor openly, uh, to torture openly. It's reduced a lot. And uh, out of thousands and thousands of cases of torture per year, it turned uh, down to 78 or something in 2019. It was around 87 or 78, I don't remember now. But of course, women were in education, more women were in, in health. We trained a lot of midwives and the um, mother and child mortality rate really came down uh, at least half of what was before the intervention. Women were in sports, women who was in business, uh, they hold the small home business, then up to a company, construction companies. Uh, journalism was, women were in journalism. They were presenters, they were singers, they were camera women, they were um, other um, human rights journalists and, and uh, a lot of other issues. Women were in police, women were in army, women were in the um, judiciary system, prosecutor, and women were judges. And we established the for the first time in the country, uh, there was equal rights in the constitution in 2004. And then for the first time, domestic violence and family uh, was criminalized and we had elimination of violence against women law. A, a lot of other issues were criminalized, including Bachaposi for the children, the dancing boys was happening in the country. There was no no article on the on the law and it was not criminalized. We did it in the Human Rights Commission. We did a national inquiry on that, and we criminal, criminalized the um, uh, bachapozi and forced marriage was criminalized. Child marriage was criminalized, although there was a lot of uh, weaknesses still because the age, the marriage age for the girls was sixteen, and I was saying that it is legalization of the child marriage, unfortunately. Uh, but of course, we didn't pay much attention on the good governance. Again, accountability and justice was, was forgotten. We allow the people who were uh, committed war crimes and crimes against humanity to be in a position of power. Then it was difficult for the people to trust that structure because they, ca they continued with their uh, violation of human rights and with their attitude. Uh, and there was not a long-term strategy for Afghanistan. It was unfortunately more reactionary and, and uh, short-term and lack of cooperation between the different countries who were involved. I just want to mention that it was 49 countries soldier in Afghanistan, including the smallest country, Luxembourg, uh, in Europe. They had a few people in the medical, uh, how, um, medical sector army people, but in the medical sector, in the uh, Kabul airport. So everybody was involved, but it was not really um, much coordination uh, in Afghanistan. Um, lack of, I would say that one of the biggest problem was lack of uh, long-term multi-dimensional strategy. Everybody was doing small things without really coordinating properly. The second issue that human rights and women's rights become kind of a um, side event issue. If you look at the, all the conferences on Afghanistan, even the pledging conferences, women's issue was side event. And I had a problem with that. I said, why we are not in the event, why we are inside event. And that is not, I think, a good approach. And we should learn from the, the uh, mistake that we did in Afghanistan. And the third point, again, Accountability and justice was not really taken seriously. And that fueled the culture of impunity. That fueled the corruption, that fueled the nepotism, that fueled the, um, the destructive attitude towards the different ethnic group and minority group in the, in the country. And I think that is, uh, that is um, one of the big, big problem that we faced in Afghanistan and we see it. And that's why I'm saying that the Afghanistan case is a collective failure of Afghan government, Afghan people, 
in the international community, whoever was involved. If you look at the strategy of the US towards Afghanistan, we didn't know when you were leaving. Because we were leaving, we reduced the soldier away, and then, of course, the with the um, peace deal which was which was signed in 2020, February 2020, the Taliban in Doha was a mistake, I think, because uh, as an Afghan, I, I don't want the in, uh, international community or the U.S. soldier to stay forever in Afghanistan, but. It should be a proper strategy to how to maintain, how to promote democracy in a country. Of course, the, the other mistake and why Afghanistan was failed was the issue, the invasion in Iraq, because in 2003, when US went to Iraq, all the attention was drawn to Iraq. Of course, it was quite expensive to, to run too big war. Uh, and then already announced by the uh, US administration that Afghanistan is a success story. It was not success story. And what happened? And I think for promotion of democracy, for promotion of stability in the other countries who are suffering from violence, who are suffering from dictatorship, who are suffering of, uh, on, on, uh, from Taliban style uh, uh, people, is to promote democracy and to empower the people of that country. So Taliban came back on 15 of August and it's the same people you saw last week. They promised everyone that they are going to open the school for the girls on 22nd of March or 23rd of March. But then they took their words back. But they are playing. They, they, when they, the Minister of, of Education publicly said, we don't care what the international community say. It is Islamic, which is not Islamic because Islam started with Iqra. Iqra means read. When the first message came to the Prophet to Muhammad, peace upon him, it was said that read. And the first person who converted to Islam was Khadija, the wife of the Prophet. So everywhere in Quran, it's, they, it's said that all human being was made with equal dignity. So that is not there. I mean, they, they have their own interpretation. And of course, the Taliban and extremist group, not only the Afghan extremist Taliban, but any extremist uh, is using always the um, religion and culture in order to control half of the population. It's simple, uneducated people and use the religion to to control them and use the uh, culture also. And unfortunately that excuse has been used always that we, um, people were saying that, oh, Afghanistan is a very conservative and traditional country can Western values uh, like human rights is implementable in Afghanistan. And I was fighting that it's not Western value, it's a human value. So now Taliban, doesn't have a proper policy or a strategy for governance, but every week they release one um, order, including women cannot go to the parks, for example. They cannot go to the park to be mixed. Now they, they made three days of the week for women to go to the parks and four days for the men in a week. I mean, then who's taking these women to those parks? the family member. And even in the park, you have to wear proper dress because you're, for the schools, for the university, they say, they keep saying the proper dress. And one of them today uh, said, one of the Maulavis that the God, the God and the prophet said that the women are not allowed to, to learn computer. There was no computer 1400 years ago. So all these, I mean, it's completely against hadith because uh, one of the hadiths that the prophet said that every Muslim man and woman should be educated, even if it's China, of course, that, and that time from Saudi to China was really long with the camel or with horses. But now they are, um, they're stopping people from access to education. So I stop here because I spoke more than 
the time that I was supposed to to speak in. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Oh, Dr. Samar, you, 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 we could listen to you all day. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. And you know, I, I'm just reading a uh, uh, an entry someone put in the chat who said, um, "Wait a minute, where is it?" This person said, "Mind blowing effort for the women in Afghanistan." Hats off to Dr. Sima. Would you would this person would like to hear your advice on how the international community and international leaders in particular could address these issues today, these women's issues? Yeah. One, I think the uh, excuse for respect and culture, culture and, and uh, religion and also sovereignty of the country should not be used as an excuse not to push for women's rights. Women's rights is a human rights and a way to respect. Because Afghanistan ratified seven important international conventions we have obligation to Im implement those. We don't, I mean, the country should not ratify the convention and put it on the shelf. It should be applied practically. By the way, Afghanistan currently is the only country without constitution. It's mm -hmm. the only country which again, officially put restriction on girls' education. In the world, you cannot find another country. So we are not the only Muslim country. Yeah. And it's good that Islamic uh, uh, countries came up with the um, condemnation of the uh, Taliban um, uh, policy. But I think condemnation is not enough. Everybody has to be strong and putting pressure, every possible pressure on them in order to, to push them to accept the principle of human rights yes. and implement that including women's access. I was saying that it's our access to education is not enough. We are human being. We should have all the rights that everybody else has. Yes. So international community can put pressure. First of all, they should not be recognized at all or no other country should be recognized if they don't respect human rights. Yes. Uh, and secondly, I think international community can support the local NGOs and local initiative to facilitate access to education. Because I was running girls' school during their first government, and I'm able to run again. There is a lot of young, educated girls and boys who is willing to do that at home and the mosque, under the tree, what, wherever, in any level. Well, uh, following on that thought, um, our, our Nicole Brian is asking um, that with your nonprofit, the Shahuda, uh, what, what are they doing now? And are the schools in Pakistan for refugees, are they still viable? Are they still working? Um, uh, what's happening there? Well, Shahuda is working still. Uh, they are running some health uh, and they are because the situation was better, we were building, they were building schools in very remote part of the country and then handing over to the government because government was, uh, was running that. Um, it was a big uh, governmental education program and the government should be responsible because that was in the constitution that every Afghan, um, it was compulsory, although we had a lot of uh, children out of school. But it is compulsory uh, education for any children or any Afghans to have access to free education system in the country. And the government has responsibility to provide. So the Shohada was building schools, construction of the schools and handing over to the government because in the very, very remote areas where nobody else was going. They're still doing that. And they are running some relief program these days and including uh, running of orphanages because uh, with good quality education for the children. Of course, we have a lot of orphans in the country. And also they are running some health program, including reproductive rights because I was one of the person lobbying for women's access to contraception because we should not produce all these children to be a firewood for the extremists. Yeah. 
it increased the poverty, it increased the, the level of violence in the family, including the domestic violence. Imagine the people are so desperate with the humanitarian crisis in the country that they sell their daughters from selling their young child daughter up to higher, I mean, higher age or, or um, elderly in order to feed the rest of the family. It's a very, very difficult yeah. environment and situation. It's beyond wording. Mm. So we should not accept that because Taliban taking over Afghanistan, the fundamentalist groups are emboldened already, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab and all those, uh, ISIS, and also patriarchy is increased including in our own country, because the male member of the family under the name of protection now trying to protect girls, trying to say that wear proper clothes not to be, be beaten up in the street. So that is also, you know, it's, it's indirect connection between fundamentalism and uh, patriarchy. Patriarchy. And, yeah, and uh, fundamentalism is not only Islamic fundamentalism, we see in our region, all the religion. Yeah, it's not just Islamic fundamentalism, you're saying. Exactly. So here's a, here's a uh, comment from John uh, Afsa Sawari. And she said, dear Dr. Samar, I started my school in one of your secret schools in Ghazni province in 1999. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for creating those opportunities for Afghan girls. As the world has, sh oh, makes me so sad. <laughs> As the world has shattered for us Afghan women, what is one advice you could give your fellow Afghan women for fighting for their rights and justice? One, I think we have to continue our struggle. We did continue during the previous government, during the Republic also. It was not easy. It was not easy to convince the people who were in power, even in the parliament, we were not able to pass the elimination of violence against women law from the parliament because they, they were insisting on three things. One, the age of the marriage. I don't know what they want, why they are um, enjoying seeing a child to be married. The second thing was the polygamy. Um, uh, the, in the article on that law, it was that the second wife or the third wife cannot be taken by a man unless the first one or the second one was con had a consent or agreed to them. Although it's not fair, but we, we are also trying to be, um, how to say, not to be too or radical in order to convince them. The third point was also, um, what was it? I, I forgot, but the, there was a third article that they were opposing it. And that was, uh, uh, again, I think the criminal age for girls and boys, because they were insisting that the girls, when they are because when you are fasting as a Muslim, the girls start earlier, the boys start later. So they were saying if the Islam uh, asking the girls or uh, yes, asking the girls to perform the Islamic duty or responsibility, then they are, it means that they are mature and they are ready for being a mother or being a wife or things like that so that is also something i would like to thank your, your the lady who wrote i mean i did my job but i wish i i could do more and i can do more because it's it's easy to run those kind of schools we have the experience um, of the previous years and it's more young teachers available on that time we, we didn't have enough female teachers yeah. because it was there were no schools and we had, we were, the teachers were uh, teaching in the school and then uh, we had the program teacher training for them on the science subject, mm -hmm. on the chemistry and, and biology and, and physics and math. 
and those because history and geography they can learn when they read, but science that was difficult. So we we had three year, two, three months during the winter training for the teachers in order to prepare them for next year when the school and the girls or the boys in school was in a higher class. So I think education is really, really key. And also, I think we need to stand for our rights. And that comes through education. Yes. Education is the strongest tool to fight against ignorance, mm -hmm. not only in Afghanistan, in any other country. Every, anywhere, absolutely. So Ahmed Omar um, says first, thank you, uh, Dr. Seema for your nice presentation. As we know, Prophet says that educating women means educating society so that we can say that those who neglect women in Afghanistan misunderstood the religion regarding women's roles in the society. So. Yes, exactly. I think exactly it. Um, what they say, I don't know, they say it. It's Taliban interpretation that the women are not complete. I mean, they are, uh, and how they can be complete if they're born from a human who is incomplete. <laughs> and and they are feed it from the blood of their mother. Even if the milk is not red like the blood, but it is made from the blood of the mothers. We all know this. Course. How can you ignore your own dignity yes. and how you can be complete from incomplete person? Yeah, it's it's illogical to say the least, to say the very yeah, least. Exactly. Um, and I wanted to uh, Alexandra Laval as asking you, Dr. Samar, how can we support your activities from Europe? Well, I think there's, uh, as I said, that there's a possibility to even from uh, to lobby for Afghan women and keep the agenda, the women's rights and human rights in, in Afghanistan on the agenda, because I'm not saying that the people in Ukraine deserve protection. But Afghanistan is really a chronic case and yeah. it requires a really deeper assessment and, and uh, long term a strategy to recover from that deep wound mm -hmm. of 44 years. People were stuck between the left, radical left of the USSR and radical right of Taliban. So we have to keep the, the women in the, in the agenda, women's right in the agenda. Secondly, from your personal donation, you can give the possibility of a girl child or a boy child, boy child uh, the possibility to, to be educated. Yeah. Thirdly, I think we can at least keep the basic, basic health services alive. Mm. Because if there's lack of health facilities, the mortality of mothers go up and more children right. are well born. So I think it's, it's really um, yeah, provision of basic social services is really a need and particularly focusing on, on education. And we can do a lot. I mean, we can now, with thanks to technology, we can use technology in order to teach them if there is a money, because people doesn't have access to internet. If we can give them few of only per month in order to have a better uh, telephone, mm -hmm. they can, be, can have access to, to classes online classes. That would be so helpful, just, just having that access, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, um, Justina Dillon uh, says, Dr. Seema, you are an inspiration to all of us. I worked in Afghanistan as a lawyer with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Mm -hmm. And in my capacity with NRC, I worked on projects with Shuhada and in um, Bamyan. And I have followed your work with the AI, with the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. I'm now working with the current 
a commission to provide information on how to get staff to Canada. I wanted to know how we can all harness the collective intellectual capacity of the Afghan women in Afghanistan to press for change today. Well, I think, um, first of all, thank you very much. And I, maybe we saw each other and we um, support each other's work because we had a lot of program at the NRC, particularly for the returnees and the IDPs who were coming back to the, their original. I remember in Faryab, we had a lot of program together. Uh, yes, I think one thing that we can do, we are still, me personally also, we are still in shock what happened. Yeah. I personally came to US to see my family before the collapse. So I was one of the lucky not being evacuated in that very difficult situation in the country. So I was already out. But I think we need to hold, pull ourselves together and work on a possible activities in the ground, not to put people in danger over there, but to find a way and do continue the monitoring of the human rights situation. Currently, there is no place for women to go. Ministry of Women's Affairs is turned to be Ministry of Vice and Virtue. And I remember how I started that, that ministry, how many sleepless nights I spent on that. And the Human Rights Commission is closed. All the staff is scattered everywhere. And the other NGOs, the uh, prosecu in the prosecutor office, we had the special um, department for elimination of violence against women is closed. Nobody is there, no female prosecutor, no female judges, no female police. And I feel so sorry because I was the one pushing for female inclusion. Fighting with the uh, Supreme Court, fighting with the president, fighting with the Minister of uh, Interior and Minister of um, Defense in order to include women in their program. And in, we hold a lot of training for female police, for female judges, for female prosecutor on human rights in order to give them uh, self-confidence to, to enable them to work. And now all those are gone. We need to find a way to at least document those uh, crimes committing in Afghanistan. It's very, very difficult, but it is not impossible. It requires some money and funding. Well, hopefully, hopefully this talk that this inspiring talk that you've given today, uh, Dr. Samar, will you know will raise consciousness to the point where people will uh, respond and I, I I just have a feeling you're going to hear more from our audience and uh, I'm sorry that we have to cut off the people who were had asked questions we we obviously don't have time but I did want to take a moment uh, and so thank you Dr. Samar thank you from for all of us from PON and the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs we're just delighted that we can give you a platform uh, and a voice here today. So thank you for everything that you've done on behalf of women in the world, because it's not just the Afghan women that you're inspiring, you're inspiring all of us. Thank so, you so much. Just call on me. Anytime. All right, we know who to call on. Um, and so before I turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Bryant at PON, I wanted to just briefly say that um, many of you probably already know, but our beloved Professor, <clears throat> Professor Kalman passed away on March 1st. And even though he led a beautiful life, he was 94 years old, just about to turn 95. He lived a very rich and rewarding life and he left a legacy that is monumental. And even though in, in, he's not here with us, he's here with us in spirit and will be because so many of us around the world who have been trained by him, mentored by him, are just going to continue doing the work. So um, I just wanted to pass that along and not, not uh, uh, you know, have, have his passing um, not be recognized here today. And there will be a memorial. Um, we will let you know it's being organized by Harvard University. And likely it'll be in the fall. 
so we will keep you all posted and we'll, um, we'll, we'll let you know when that event will take place. And now I'd like to turn it over to Nicole Bryant. Thank you so much, Donna. And uh, let, let me join uh, in my condolences from the program on negotiation community on uh, Herb Kelman's passing. I know uh, that uh, he was in addition to being a mentor of yours, Donna, a close personal friend, and I'm sure he would have delighted in this event today, really. I can't think of a better illustration uh, of the work that Herb championed. So thank you again, Dr. Samar. This was very inspiring. We had a number of people asking us in the chat for the link to your organization in order to be able to donate. Um, and uh, at least one person wasn't able to make it work. So we will make sure that the events page gets updated with the exact link. If you have a problem today, come back and check it out in case you would like to participate. I know that we would be very grateful. Um, uh, just to conclude, uh, upcoming offerings from the program on negotiation, our next event is uh, next week on April 11th with two professors uh, from Harvard Business School and one professor from UC Berkeley uh, on, a, on a new book. And then on April 14th, we will be having our great negotiator event, uh, which is an award that PON has been giving out for 20 years. That event will uh, be live streamed so that everyone on the public uh, can view it. Um, it will be on April 14th, and this year we are honoring Christiana Figueres, who is the Costa Rican diplomat, who uh, was the architect uh, of the uh, 2015 Paris Climate Accords. So we will be celebrating her achievements uh, in 2015 and since working tirelessly on climate negotiations. We look forward to seeing you at our, uh, at our future events or perhaps at one of our trainings. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. Dr. Samar, thank you for being such an inspiration in all that you do. We're wishing you well and thinking of all of the women and girls uh, and community in Afghanistan. Thank you.